So we have seen several examples of different chi-squared tests. We've seen an example of a goodness of fit test, which looks at one response variable that is categorical in nature, and we want to know if a predict uh, predicted or hypothesized model, which divides the population into different groups uh, by specific proportions, if that is a good fit for the data that we have. We've also looked at a test of independence, which looks at two categorical variables, one response and one explanatory variable, and wants to know if there is an association between those, which would be our alternative hypothesis, or if those two variables are independent, which is our null hypothesis. And both of those are done using a chi-squared test of independence. We're going to look at another example here, and this example is the sham acupuncture data. In this study, a randomized experiment was conducted exploring the effectiveness of acupuncture in treating lower back pain. 1,162 patients were randomly assigned to one of three treatment groups, verum acupuncture, which is the traditional Chinese uh, approach, sham acupuncture, which is a placebo, so this is not really acupuncture, it's just fake, and a non-acupuncture therapy, which might have been drugs or physical therapy or etc. So a non-acupuncture approach uh, to treating lower back pain. For each patient, researchers recorded whether there was a substantial reduction in pain after six months. So participants were randomly assigned to only one of three treatment groups. So what I would like you to do is pause this video and identify what is the explanatory variable and what is the response variable. The explanatory variable, <clears throat> the explanatory variable is of course the treatment. That is the type of medicine or a, a approach they had for treating their pain and it has three levels. That could be sham acupuncture, real acupuncture, or non-acupuncture. The response is the reduction in pain. And that would be two levels. Sorry, I should write this consistently. The response is the pain after six months. And that is two levels. Did they get better? or was there no reduction? So these are both categorical variables. The explanatory is categorical with three levels, whether they had sham, real, uh, sham acupuncture, real acupuncture, or a non-acupuncture intervention. And the response is whether the uh, reduction in pain was that there was no reduction or whether they got better after six months. Here we have our contingency table. And this has been uh, already reduced for us. So we have the actual counts. So there were 106 people, for example, who got better after six months with a non-acupuncture therapy. And there were 282 people in the trial who got no relief after six months with a non-acupuncture therapy. So the first entry in each cell are the observed counts. The second entry in each cell, and I will highlight them, these are the expected counts. So, for the people who received non-acupuncture therapy, we would have expected, if the two variables were independent, 153.9 of them to have gotten better. Similarly, we would have expected 153.5 people to have gotten better under sham acupuncture if the two variables were independent. So the highlighted entries in each cell are what we would have expected if the two variables were independent and the circled entries in each cell are what we actually observed. Our question is, is there an association between treatment and improvement? This is really asking the same statistical hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that there is no association between treatment and uh, improvement. How could you write this null hypothesis as an independence hypothesis? That is, how can you write this hypothesis to, to, hypothesis to be about the independence of treatments and improvement? Pause this video and write that. Also, write the alternative hypothesis for these two variables. <clears throat> 
The other way of writing this null hypothesis is that treatment and pain or improvement are independent. So these are two equivalent ways of writing our null hypothesis. If two variables are independent, then there is no association between those two variables. The alternative hypothesis then is the opposite. The alternative hypothesis is that treatment and improvement or pain are associated, which is the same thing as saying not independent. Notice there is no symbolic hypothesis, at least as far as this class is concerned, for the test of independence. We are not writing this out in terms of the true proportions. We already have the jump output. Now, I would like you to pause this video and circle the correct chi-squared statistic and the correct p-value for this test. The correct chi-squared statistic is the Pearson chi-squared statistic, and the correct p-value is the p-value for the Pearson chi-squared statistic. We have talked in previous videos that we do not use the likelihood ratio test for this class. So our chi-squared statistic, chi-squared obs, is 38.054, with a p-value which is very small, of less than 0 0.0001. So how do we answer this question of whether there is an association between treatment and improvement? We have a very small p-value of less than 0 0.0001. Is that strong or weak evidence against that null hypothesis? Is that strong or weak evidence in support of our alternative of an association? Well, we have two degrees of freedom. The number of rows is three. The number of columns is two. So R minus one is two, and C minus one is one. So two times one is two, and that's where the two degrees of freedom comes from. 38 is much bigger than two, and that's why we have such a small p-value. So we have very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. That is, our data, if I could spell, our data are highly compatible I should say our data are compatible with an association between treatment and improvement. But we saw in a previous video that there are limitations of the chi-squared test. That's why I erased that highly compatible. Right? We have strong evidence in support of an association, we have strong evidence that our data are compatible with an association between treat and treatment and improvement. But our data are not telling us how big that improvement is. A chi-squared statistic itself is not the effect. So, which treatments have strong evidence of being different than others? This is our follow-up. So, we want to look and see how might we answer this question. What do you think we should do? We could look at the difference between what we observe and what we expect. So, if we look at the none group, if we look at the non-acupuncture group, we see observed is 106 and expected is 153. This difference is big. The chi-squared contribution, 
is 106 minus 153.9 squared over 153.9. That's 14.9. For And that's just for the better. For the other, for those who did not see any improvement, we see observed is 282, the expected is 234, and so our chi-squared contribution here is 282 minus 234.1 squared over 234.1. This gives us a chi-squared contribution of 9.8. So this row alone, those who received a non-acupuncture treatment, gives us a contribution to the chi-squared of 25. So we're seeing pretty big contributions to this chi-squared statistic just from that row. So that is the largest contribution to the chi-squared statistic. So that is the largest difference between what we observed and what we expected. Everywhere else we see the sham acupuncture is pretty close to what we would observe and expect and the verum acupuncture is a lot close to what we observe and what we expect. All right, but if we look at these intervals and I'm going to emphasize you cannot get these intervals from jump. Don't try, I won't ask you to, you cannot get these intervals from jump. I got those from a different software. But if we look at these pairwise intervals from jump, the difference between real and none and real and sham, uh, these are what are different from zero. So the real acupuncture, so the verum acupuncture versus the no treatment, no real treatment, that is pretty different. We have a pretty big effect between the proportion of those who got better under the real acupuncture and the proportion of those who got better under the none. So the real uh, acupuncture improved p patient outcomes at a much higher rate than those who received a non-acupuncture intervention. Similarly, those who received the sham acupuncture uh, improved at a much higher rate than those who received no acupuncture. And I can say that because these intervals are greater than zero and even the lower bound supports a large effect. The lower bound for real versus none is 13.5%. The lower bound for sham versus none is 10.2%. So we're supporting a very large effect for real versus no acupuncture and sham versus no acupuncture at a very, very high rate. So when we see this uh, real versus none and sham versus none, we're saying having no acupuncture or having a non-acupuncture uh, non uh, intervention, that's where we're really seeing the difference. If we compare real versus sham acupuncture though, how would you interpret this? So this is the Chinese, the verum acupuncture, and this is the fake acupuncture. How would you interpret this interval. So pause the video and come back and tell me this. All right, I hope that you have interpreted this as a evidence of some association. Uh, the largest effect supported is 10%, but there is a possible, our data are compatible with uh, no association at all or a negative effect. So we're seeing that there may not be a difference, that there, uh, our data are highly variable, that there is a lot of uncertainty in this difference, and that there may not really be a difference between real and sham acupuncture at all. So what does this tell us? Right? So think overall about all three of these intervals. We're seeing an improvement between any acupuncture treatment, real and sham versus non-acupuncture, but that there's not really strong evidence in any direction between real versus fake acupuncture. 
So if we're seeing no real difference between real and fake acupuncture, then maybe the differences that we're seeing between any acupuncture and none at all is really just that placebo effect. So people here are only thinking they're getting better because of the intervention of acupuncture, and it doesn't really matter whether it's real or fake acupuncture at all. So this last question, how strong is the association? Well, there are a couple ways that we can address this. One is by looking at the difference of proportions. This is what we're used to doing. We could look at p hat real minus p hat uh, none. And I'm going to start calling this none as opposed to none because that's a little confusing. And so the proportion of people who improved uh, under real acupuncture is uh, 0.476. So this is that 184 over 387. And so that's about, that's nearly 50%. So that would be 0.4. Sorry, if I'm at the bottom of my screen, my pen doesn't work. So that's a 0.476. The proportion of people who improved under fake acupuncture, well, that's just barely a quarter. That's that 106 of the 388. So that's going to be 0.273. So the difference here is 0.203. That's what's going on, and that's what's in the middle of this interval, real minus none, 0.1356 up to 0.2689. The middle of that interval is 0 0.203. We can also compare p hat sham and p hat none. We can do that the same way. Of the 387 people who had sham acupuncture, 171 of them improved. And that gives us a proportion of 0.442. The same proportion of people, 0.273, improved under no acupuncture. And that's a difference of 0.169. So if we're just comparing proportions, we can see that there's a 20.3 percentage point difference between those who had the real acupuncture and those who had no acupuncture at all and had a traditional therapy. That's a pretty big difference. Similarly, those who had sham or fake acupuncture and those who had no acupuncture at all did better by 16.9 percentage points. Again, that's a pretty big difference. So these are pretty large differences. And that's the same thing as large effects. So that's one way to talk about the strength of association. All right? In this case, we had a small p-value and we also had large effects. That doesn't always happen. Remember, we had a previous exam example where we had a very small p-value and we had a much smaller effect. So the p-value does not tell us about the difference in the proportions. The p-value is a function of the size of the contingency table and a variety of other things. Another way to look at the strength of association is something called relative risk. And in this age of coronavirus, understanding relative risk is actually really handy. So relative risk, instead of looking at the difference of proportions, we're going to look at the ratio of proportions. So relative risk is RR, and we might think of that as a nice mnemonic for remember ratio. So relative risk is a ratio. So relative risk R's ratio. So we would look perhaps at P hat real over P hat none. Same proportions, 0.476 over 0.273. And what this tells us is that this ratio is 1.75. Therefore, patients treated with real acupuncture are 1.75 times as likely to improve as those who receive a traditional treatment. 
So this is patients who receive real acupuncture are 1.7 times 5, 1.75 times as likely to improve as those who receive a traditional treatment. That is a non-acupuncture treatment based on this sample. Because these are just our sample proportions. So what would be the relative risk for people who receive sham acupuncture versus those who receive a traditional treatment? Well, we would find it the same way. We would do p hat sham over p hat non, and that would be 0.442 over 0.273, and that ratio ends up being 1.6. So there's a slightly lower risk. Patients who receive sham acupuncture are only 1.6 times as likely to improve as those without uh, any acupuncture based on these sample data. All right, so how does relative risk relate to medicine? Well, we might look at different groups. So we could compare uh, ethnic groups and talk about risk of diseases. So if there's a higher rate of disease for one ethnic group than another, then they have a higher relative risk. We can talk about cancer rates. So the relative risk for breast cancer for females relative to males is very high. Females are much higher, have a much higher relative risk. They're way more likely to have breast cancer than males. And the reverse is true for prostate cancer. Males have a much higher relative risk, have a very high relative risk for getting prostate cancer than do females. We can talk about all sorts of uh, things. We can talk about relative risk in educational settings. We can talk about relative risk in a variety of settings. Really all it's doing is telling us about the increased chance of a specific outcome occurring for one group than another. And if the relative risk is close to one, then the chances or those proportions are similar for both of those groups. If the relative risk for one is very high, then the chance or the proportion for that are very different than one, much higher than one, then those proportions are very different and we have a very big effect. That is evidence for a strong association. So the closer the relative risk is to one, the weaker the association. The farther away from one the relative risk is, the stronger the association. We can think about the same thing for difference of proportions. The closer the difference of proportions is to zero, the weaker the association. Because if those two proportions are the same, then the difference is going to be zero. The closer the difference of proportions is to one or negative one, Did I say that right? Yes, the closer the difference of proportions is to one or negative one, the stronger the association. So that's a summary of a look at a chi-squared test for independence using a sham acupuncture and also thinking about the placebo effect. So thinking about how we can interpret all of these intervals, which again are not accessible and not uh, obtainable in jump, you would have to use different software looking at all these intervals and interpreting them together and not just one at a time. And then thinking about the strength of association, which we really have to do very carefully when we have a categorical response and a categorical predictor.